My name's Marina, I'm a knitwear designer and yarn dyer based in the southwest of England. I was about to say in Bath, but that is not where I live anymore. Um, I moved out to a small village uh, in spring last year, and so yeah, lots of house stuff going on. At the moment it's fairly quiet, but it's all going to kick off again soon, and I'm not really looking forward to it. Um, but yes, so I usually share some of my knitting projects and often some of my yarn. And before I went on maternity leave, um, I used to share a lot of other crafty projects. I'm hoping to do a bit more of that as I get some more time to do so. Fingers crossed, um, it's something I'll be able to do. I might have to try and grab just little bits of time to film as I'm able to work on things during like, naps and things. Um, but yes, so today I'm going to share a few projects with you, um, something I finished that was like the quickest thing in the world, and a couple of other things I'm working on, and then a couple of things that are a little bit unusual. Uh, I'm going to be chatting about needles, which I don't think is something I've done at all before because I'm, well, I, my needle situation is, I'll, I'll get into it later. <laughs> So first up is my headband. And it's all mostly covered up by my hair. Um, you may have noticed I'm growing my hair out. Um, it's, it's not what I want it to be, to be frank. Um, it's, it's sort of a bit too short and a bit too long all at the same time. Um, if you have watched the podcast from a very long time ago, you will have seen my hair go from a pixie to long mad witchiness. Um, that's what we're doing again. It's something I do every three to five years. I basically cut all my hair off really really short, grow it out again, um, and then cut it off when I get bored again. Sometimes I'll do some in betweeny things, I'll occasionally have a fringe, sometimes I'll keep it at shoulder length for a while, um, but it's basic, basically grow it out, chop it off. Um, I get bored of it quite quickly and stage is one of my least favourite. So it gets in my face a lot um, and so I've been wearing headbands a bit more um, just to keep it out of my eyes because at the moment it's sort of peak stabbing in eye length which is not what we want and also just because it's not it's just not how I want it to look at all. I want something that makes it feel a little bit more pretty. Um, so I knit it up this little headband, um, and since the last episode I've knitted it, test knitted it, and released the pattern. Um, it's a really quick little knit. I did mine in an evening. I used some uh, hand spun yarn that I had left over from a cardigan project I made last year, and I just wanted to make something cute and pretty. And so the pattern is in te it, I've written it so that it's really easy to size because I'll take it off quickly. I've got some pins holding most of my hair in place so it shouldn't go everywhere. Um, so you start at one end of the ribbing because there's a little ribbed section at the back here so it's not quite so thick at the back of your head. A um, little section of ribbing, you start with a provisional cast on and then you work some lace all the way around and you basically just keep going until it's the length you want. Now this one actually, I'd like to make another one. Um, because this yarn has a lot of mohair and soy and alpaca and things that don't have much stretch at all, you can see it's quite sort of, there's not much elasticity to it and it's a bit floppy. Um, so while it's very pretty, it doesn't stay in place particularly amazingly. So if I were to do this one again using this particular yarn, I would have used a little bit 
more negative ease, so I would have made it just slight, probably a couple of lace repeats shorter before finishing it. Um, so I'd like to make another one using bouncier yarn. Um, but I've written it for pretty much any weight yarn. So if you use a heavier yarn, you'll end up with a slightly wider headband. If you use a lighter one, you'll end up with a skinnier one. Um, but the idea is to use up yarn scraps. So this one was roughly a fingering weight held double, um, which ended up being sort of a DK weight. So DK is kind of what you're aiming for, but there's nothing to stop you making a nice chunky version or a nice delicate little fine version. Um, and mine used 12 grams of yarn. So I've recommended 15 to 20 grams in the pattern just to make sure you don't run out. But some testers used as little as six grams um, and some people used like 15. Um, yeah, and uh, quite a few of my testers have already made multiple versions. I think someone made three or four, uh, which is just so lovely um, because it is just that kind of project that you can do so quickly um, and just have lots of different ones to go with different outfits. Um, so yeah, it's called the Ramosa headband. Ramosa is the botanical Latin for branched or branchy. So like these little lacy patterns that just kind of go like this, um, remind me of um, like bare twigs that come out of a stem, um, which there's a lot of about at the moment. Lots of new growth on things growing outside, which I'm very excited about. Um, Yes, it, it turns out that lots of my pattern names include some botanical Latin these days, which I don't mind. Um, yeah, so that is that one. Um, I think that is all I have to say about it. It's on Ravelry, it's on my website. It's fairly inexpensive because um, I haven't had to do any grading for it. All of the sizing is up to you and you just try it round your head every so often as you're knitting it to make sure it's going to be the right length. Um, but yeah, I would recommend lots of negative ease so it stays in place on your head nicely. Um, this one's fine when I use a couple of pins and like I don't need to put the pins in the headband, they just keep my hair in place and then the headband sits on top to make it all a bit prettier. Um, yeah. I will mention my outfit because it's one that I haven't worn in a long time and used to be a favourite. Um, and I just kind of like how the headband is going with this. Sorry, I'm looking at the screen and it's silly. Um, so the headband is this sort of browny pinky tone, which I think goes quite nicely with the readiness of the rest of this. Um, so this is my Snowland cardigan, which is a pattern by Jessica MacDonald. Um, it's a really nice pattern. I made it, I modified it slightly to be worked in two yarns. So it's a worsted spun undyed coloured merino, which is what you can see around the neckband and at the hem here. And I've alternated it every row with, or round on the sleeves um, with some hand spun that I made years and years ago that was one ply, so it's two different singles plied together. One ply was spun from an art bat, so lots of nice like reddy, browny, rich shades, uh, sort of similar to the dress. And then the other ply was a naturally grey blue face Lester. So I twisted them together for a bit of a barber for whole thing. And then the fact that the grey blue face Lester is quite similar in colour to the undyed merino that I've got here um, means that you just get these little flecky bits of dark red throughout it which I think is quite pretty. Um, and the dress I'm wearing is one that I haven't worn in a long time. The cardigan I didn't wear for a long time because I lost it. I lost it, I mean, it was at the back of my drawer and I forgot about its existence and then I remembered it and I was like, I love that cardigan, where's it gone? And I was thinking that I must have lost it in the move and maybe it accidentally went to the charity shop. Or... It was in my drawer. Um, and so I didn't wear it for like almost a year just because 
it didn't occur to me to look for it because my brain hasn't been great recently. Um, my dress is uh, wool. It is from fabric that I wove out of yarn that I dyed. Um, it's just like a British lamb's wool weaving yarn that I got a few cones of years ago. Um, so I dyed the yarn for the warp um, dark purple and then the yarn for the weft kind of like a bright red. And so combined it gives this really nice sort of deep rich sort of maroony red. Um, got a couple of little pleats and a waist seam and then a pocket for my phone. So that pocket is that shape because that is the piece that was cut out of the front of the neckline. Um, and I just specifically made sure that it was going to be big enough to fit my phone in it. And that's, that's what we do. Try and waste as little of the fabric as possible. So I ended up with like a little handful of trimmings, um, which I will use to stuff something. Um, I've actually got a chair that I want to re-upholster and the base has gone a bit, uh, and I might stuff the base with like leftover wool trimmings and things. Projects for another day. <laughs> so yes, that is what I'm wearing. That is a headband, what I made. Um, I really like the headband. As other people have done, I would like to make many more. It's a very, very quick project and super fun. Um, and it's like you, you've got a little provisional cast on and a graft in there, so it's not like completely mindless. If they're unfamiliar techniques, it's a really nice way to learn them because you're doing it across such a small stitch count um, and it's like really low stakes if it goes wrong. Um, and because, you know, grafting, so kitchener stitch, um, can just be a little bit fiddly to get the hang of and make sure that you get all the yarn going in the right direction through the stitches in the correct way. Um, once you get the hang of it, it's great. I have to look it up every single time I do it. That's just how it goes. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna show you a couple of things that I am working on. So the first thing I'd like to show you is something I showed a couple of episodes ago, but not the last one because I hadn't really made enough progress to be worth talking about. Um, this is my heath. I think I'm getting it right now. I don't speak Welsh and it's got some difficult sounds. Uh, this is a design by Teresa Shingler. Um, it is a nice cable tank top, as you can see. Um, it's a really lovely design. I'm really enjoying it. Um, I've stalled a little bit because I'm scared. I've got the fear. Um, so I'm using hand spun yarn uh, in a really like crunchy granola colour. Um, it's a mix of like naturally dark brown wool and wool I dyed with avocado and... Oh that might be it actually, I think there's only avocado and then there's some naturally fawn alpaca in there um, to make this sort of... Mm, mid brown sludginess. Um, so I finished the front, which I really enjoyed, and I've got the back in progress. Um, so you have these panels that go up the sort of back sides and then they meet at the shoulder with the front sections. Um, I think it's an excellent design, I really like the way it's done. I've made some modifications um, because I'm using a much heavier yarn than is specified and also I don't have much of the yarn so I've reduced the stitch count in the stockinette sections and modified accordingly. Um, this is all I have left. I have the fear. <laughs> I've stopped working on it for a little bit just because I'm scared. Um, if I hold it upside down like that is how much of the back I have left to do. And then I need to do some ribbing around the armholes and neckline. Um, I've always intended to do much skinnier ribbing um, 
around the armholes and neckline than Teresa's put in the pattern, just because I prefer the way it looks. Um, even so, like that's, it's really not much yarn. Um, I will just plow on at some point and then prove to myself like, yep, you didn't have enough yarn to make the thing. And it's not like I can just make more of the yarn because I don't have any of the fibres left that I used to make it. It was literally all I had. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see what Marina decides to do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just me being a bit... Um, I've done this before. I do it quite a lot. I did the same with this one, actually. This one, I combined the two yarns because I didn't have enough of either of them um, to make a garment from, and I really like making garments. I ended up running out of yarn just at the wrist, so the cuffs there are a lot skinnier than they're meant to be, and I would have liked the cuffs to be a bit deeper, longer. Um, I've got quite long arms. Um, but this one worked out fine. This one might not. Uh, so we'll see how we go. But in the meantime, it's beautiful. Look how lovely those cables are. And it's got me really enjoying cables again. Um, so I'm having lots of fun with cables and I am beginning to design some more things with cables. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so yes, that one is currently in the naughty corner, even though it's not its fault, it's my fault. Um, the next one I'm absolutely loving. I have showed this one a lot, but I'm making nice progress and I'm pleased with it. This is the jumper that I am making for my husband. Um, it is a design I have come up with especially for him in colours that I hope will go with his clothes. Um, and they're colours that he likes. He likes lots of sort of bluey, greeny, greyness. Um, and yeah, so I finished the yoke. We've separated, got the sleeves on hold, just on a bit of scrap yarn there. And I'm just going round and round on the body, which I will be doing for the rest of forever, because he is a long bodied man. Um, yeah, sort of that, so you can see. At the back we've got some short row shaping there. Um, I've modified how I've done the short rows in this one. Um, a couple of my previous yoke patterns, um, so Wayod and Sarcactus, um, I used, I did the short rows in a specific way and I've just changed how I've done them to see if I prefer how it'll fit on this one. Um, I think on the previous ones it's it's okay. Um, I don't think there's really a problem with it, but I just, this is a little bit simpler to work and I want to see if it'll have an effect on the fit. Um, I've only got one needle on here because needle situation, which I will talk about. Um, but yeah, I'm really enjoying it. I love these four colours. Um, in the last, ep I think it was the last episode, I played a little bit with some possible colour combinations for different versions. Um, I really like that it gives scope for lots of playing, because while I'm knitting this, I can think of future versions that I'll probably never get round to knitting in different colours. Um, but you could really simplify it and just have, like, replace the turquoise and the white here with the background colour. And just have a two colour version. If you were doing that, I'd say go for higher contrast because you can see uh, where we've got this greeny gray at the bottom of the color work yoke. The contrast with the blue is really low, which is what, something I wanted for this particular version. Um, but you could go for, yeah, like a nice high contrast two color version. You could do the yoke background color, all one color. So have these tur this turquoise and the white, just do those in the same color. Um, so you could do it in two, three, four, or even more colors. You could do each of these bands in a different color. Um, so yeah, there's loads of scope for play. And I wanted to do that because I really love creating color combinations. Um, and I don't have many patterns that include lots of colours like that, and I'd like to do a bit more of it. 
Um, yes, so I am making this as part of the Out of the Dark make-along, which I have talked about in previous episodes, if you want to know what the make-along is all about. Um, either go back and watch previous episodes, or go on my Instagram, where I've got a pinned post with um, a live video I did when I started the make-along in the beginning of January. There's a blog post on my website as well that has all of the details. Um, but basically, make something with my patterns or yarn, and you might win prizes. And on that note, I'm going to share just a few prizes with you. Um, so first up is this one. This is a skein of Apple Door DK by John Arban. Um, this is the colour Dufflin, which is what I used for my scrumper waistcoat, and John Arban have very kindly said I can give this one as a prize um, for someone in the make-along. Um, I've raved about this yarn quite a lot. I really love it. I love the tweediness of it. I love the way the colours blend together. Um, I really enjoy the texture it gives when it's knitted up. Um, yes, it is a beautiful and delightful yarn. And I really like the people at John Arban. They're wonderful to work with and I've known quite a few of them for a long time and it's really nice to be doing a bit more work with them these days. And if you're into John Arban, keep an eye on what they're doing because they've got some test knits for their next issue of the annual coming up and there may be some projects that you might like in there. Um, I've been very busy with designs, I've mentioned this. <laughs> Um, then we've definitely got like a bluey green theme going on at the moment. Um, I've got this skein of Tundra by the Fiber Co. Um, so this is a super chunky, not super chunky, but it's like a really chunky yarn. Um, it's just preposterously soft. It is so soft. Um, I at one point was working with this yarn and another yarn that I consider to be really quite soft and I went from that yarn to this one and it made that one feel like sandpaper like <laughs> this is delicious it's um let me just check the fiber blend for you because fiber code do really interesting blends um 60 percent alpaca 30 percent wool and 10 percent silk um and I love one wool and alpaca. It's a combination I have used quite a lot. Um, and silk is something I don't really use much, but it's really nice for that little bit of luxury in there. Um, so yes, Fiberco do really interesting blends. I have been, I haven't used their yarns as much as I would like. Um, I released a shawl a few years ago called Leoma, which is uh, it uses their Luma yarn, which is a wool, linen, possibly there's a bit of silk in that one too. Uh, is it like a summer DK yarn? Um, and I've used some of their Acadia and one called Knightsbridge. I think it's called Knightsbridge, which I believe has been discontinued now. Um, but kind of like John Arburn, um, they were sort of an inspiration to me in how I approach yarn and especially spinning. Um, like the way I combine fibres uh, and colours uh, within blends. Um, I, I find their yarns really interesting. This one is more of a, you know, it's, it's a solid colour, but some of their other yarns um, have really interesting sort of nips and sort of almost a shimmery look. Um, and I think you do get that in some colours of the Tundra as well. Um, this one is just a glorious deep blue. Um, this is North Blue, I think. North Blue. Um, and it's not the same, but enjoying dark blues at the moment. Um, yes, so a skein of that up for grabs for people who participate in the make-along. Um, and then this one, if you have 
followed what I do for a while, you will be aware that I love Harriet of Wildwood Stitches. She's a friend of mine, she's lovely human, and she makes glorious bags. So she has very kindly donated a little notions pouch um, in just this really nice, it's kind of like a summer evening. Like, you know, when the sun has long set and it's not quite dark yet, and you've just got that little bit of glow left uh, in the sky and it's just lighting things up. Um, yeah, that's what that feels like to me. Uh, so it's a sweet notions pouch. We've got this turquoisey um, Harris Tweed on the bottom. Uh, and then a nice little teal and turquoise lining. And then this pretty fabric that has flowers and birds, which are things I love. Um, so those things are prizes in the Make Along, and then there will be a couple of um, Marina Skewer gift vouchers. Um, they will be £40 each. Uh, so that should be enough to get you, for example, three skeins of Mendip and a garment pattern. That will take you neatly to £40. Um, or, you know, three skeins of yarn and then some shipping, depending where you are. In the UK it would easily cover shipping. Um, or, you know, if you wanted to put that towards a garment quantity that you might not otherwise go for. Or, yeah, lots of options. Um, so those are the prizes that are available at the moment. If lots of other people take part in the Make Along, um, I will make sure there are a couple more prizes available because I want to make sure that lots of people have lots of nice things. Um, so yes, I am really enjoying seeing what people are making and I hope that more of you will join in. We've got, as of like this weekend, about a month left of the Make Along, so there is still plenty of time to join in. Make a headband? It takes you like three hours if you're a reasonable knitter, like reasonable, reasonably paced knitter. If you are, I'm waffling. <laughs> if you are not the slowest knitter in the world and you have knitted things before, it will be not too difficult for you and you should be able to get it finished in an evening and it's an enjoyable project and a very easy way to enter the make-along. Um, let's leave it at that. I will now talk to you about knitting needles. So needles. I have had a bit of a battle with needles. Ah, that's probably overstating it. Needles have been an ongoing thing. Um, so when I first started getting serious about knitting, um, I had always sort of knitted on either inherited straight needles um, or like random circular needles that I picked up as and when without really putting much thought into them other than the size of the needles. Um, so I didn't pay attention to like material or other than I started getting metal because they were the most easily available, then I liked wood and bamboo because they feel nice and that was sort of as much thought went into it. Um, when I started getting serious about things, I got myself a Knit Picks kit. <laughs> you can tell there's quite a few empty bits, um, either ones that are on projects or that are gaps to be filled. Um, these are Knit Picks. I should have looked what they are. They're sun something, not sunshine. Um, they are wooden ones. They, so knit picks, I hadn't realised when I ordered them that they were coming from the States because I just didn't pay attention then. Um, so they took ages to arrive. Um, you will hear people tell you that Knit Pro, who I, th I think are in UK and Europe, and then I think they are called Knitter's Pride in the States, North America. Not really sure. You will hear people tell you that Knit Pro and Knit Picks are the same. They're absolutely not the same. Um, they are compatible. Uh, the Knit Picks quality I have generally found to be much better. So these sets 
Um, I really love them. I've used these needles endlessly. And I got wooden ones because I thought wood was nice. Um, I still use the plastic carry case they came in because it's clear and I can see which ones are elsewhere. Um, and they've got like a reasonable size tip to them. And it's not really something I've paid a huge amount of attention to uh, until fairly recently um, when it really came to my attention. Like I've, I've gradually, I've been, I am stumbling a lot, good lord, sorry. I have been paying more attention to what my hands are doing when I'm knitting because I've had ongoing wrist issues. Um, I am planning a whole separate video on that, which uh, is going to take some time to put together because I want to be demonstrating lots of different things about how to avoid and potentially help wrist pain um, from knitting. Uh, it's a subject I care about a lot. It has had a huge impact on my life and work. Um, planning a video on that. Part of that is that I am paying attention to my technique and how I'm knitting and what things when I'm knitting hurt my wrists. And one of the things that I have found really frustrating is doing cables on needles that aren't sharp enough. Um, now, for a lot of people, lace will be the thing that gets you. Um, and for me, this is because I'm doing cables without a cable needle. So I'm uh, slipping the stitches further along the needle onto my working needle, dropping the other stitches off and crossing them over that way, um, which means digging around trying to get stitches onto the needle from often slightly awkward angles. Um, and when you are doing something at a slightly looser gauge, so where the yarn you are using is a bit lighter than you would usually use, than the size of needles you're using. So for example, if you were doing a fingering weight on a 3.5 millimeter needle. Usually you would use a smaller needle than that. But that means the ratio of yarn to needle size is not favorable. It's difficult to work those stitches, especially if you have blood needles. These are somewhere in between. They're like, they're not sharp, but they're not super blunt. They're fine. Um, gradually, I've been replacing the smaller end of these more and more frequently because I snap wooden needles when they're small. Um, some have been trodden. These ones are quite good. They're fairly strong. Um, some have been trodden on. Um, these also only go down to a 3.5 millimeter, whereas you can get Knit Pro interchangeables uh, down to a three millimeter, so three millimeter and 3.25. Um, I don't know if you can get smaller ones from Knit Picks separately. Um, and so I don't even know if I have the like standard Knit Pro Symphony, which I think are the most common ones. Um, I don't have one in here. I don't know where they've gone. Never mind. Um, but those ones, I found they snap really, really easily. You might recognize them. They're like rainbow striated wood. Um, they're visually a bit much, um, but they're quite available and they are compatible with my interchangeable set. That is the big thing. I have a set, I have loads and loads of cables. <laughs> um, this doesn't include the ones that are obviously on projects or floating about elsewhere at the moment. Um, another Harriet Wildwood Stitches. Uh, Notions pouch. This is a really little one that she made for me um, when we did a collab uh, a couple of years ago. It keeps all of my chaos in. Um, I don't want to change uh, like interchangeable format. Um, so when I have needed circular needles smaller than three millimeter, which is the smallest I can get for um, the interchangeable ones. I have been getting Chowgu um, just because they don't need to be compatible and they're just super nice. Um, and 
it's not like I'm going to be getting loads of them um, because they are considerably more expensive and that is really something I have to consider as much as these are tools I use to work um, I, I have to keep things in mind um, so of these I just have a 2.75 millimeter and a 2 millimeter um, these are really really nice they are really quite sharp um, the cables don't kink which I love um, dropped an end stopper thingy um, I've got lots of other miscellaneous stuff in here but so the chow goos I've really enjoyed using sometimes the because I knit continental and I push the tip of my needle to move my stitches along um, I have to keep in mind that sometimes it makes my fingers a bit sore because they are super sharp um, so these are red lace um, and I'll try and see so these are 2.75 so the nearest I have in the knit pro zings I'm being quite chaotic here I'm sorry um, so I started using knit pro zing for the interchangeable ones that are smaller because they're not wood and so they won't snap um, so knit pro zing are the metal ones they have a coloured main section and then a silver tip um, these are three millimeter and these are 2.75 so yes these are a little bit smaller but I don't know if you can see these are horrendously blunt uh, which isn't a bad thing always um, they for things like color work with a really nice round yarn they can be lovely um, for stockinette with a yarn that might be a bit splitty they're great um, so I'm not saying blunt needles always bad however for trying to do cables or lace or something where you just have to get into stitches that are a little bit tight or at a weird angle um, these are not my friends um, and I noticed it when trying to use the 3.5 millimeter ones with my Mendip 4 ply because I was doing a swatch with uh, going for a slightly loose floaty fabric but with cables on and it was a nightmare um, I, I couldn't make like it was really frustrating to try and make cables with these and so yes I turned to Instagram and asked if anyone had any opinions on knitting needles and whether they had recommendations for knit pro compatible not necessarily knit pro brand but compatible needles that I would be able to get to add to my collection that I could use to fill gaps where I've broken or lost needles it's actually it's always broken it's never lost <laughs> always broken um so ones that wouldn't break and are nice and sharp and I had a few people recommend Royale which I had a look and they seem to be wood with a metal tip which still means that even though they might be sharp they're still probably going to snap in the smaller sizes for me because I'm a brute with my knitting um and then quite a few people recommended Nova which seemed to be the go-to for sharper knit pro needles but then quite a few people brought to my attention the fact that Knit Pro have recently released a new range. I don't know how recently. Um, and lots of people vouching for the mindful collection of Knit Pro needles. Um, and uh, No Frills Knitting, a uh, shop in Bristol. Um, had a chat with them and was sent photos comparing the Zings, the Nova and the Mindful ones um, to see like in the same size to compare how sharp the tips are and these by far were the sharpest which is really satisfying and really really helpful like if you can find if you can find a yarn shop that will do that for you yay go businesses that do that I love it um and so I bought a couple of sizes that I didn't have 
um, because I've broken my needles. Um, and so I bought some 3.25 millimeters and some four millimeters. Um, and the first thing that occurred to me, so they are completely metal, they're just one piece. Um, first thing that I noticed is that they're a little bit shorter than the zings. I took them out of the packet and thought, oh no, I've accidentally ordered shorties. But that is not the case. It's like a centimeters difference, um, which I find quite interesting. Um, we will see how we go. I have quite large hands, long fingers, um, which means that sh properly short needles, like nine centimeter ones, which I ordered by accident at one point. Um, not, not for me, not remotely for me. Um, but there's, so there's a centimeters difference there. I don't think it'll make that much difference, but we will see. Um, and they are, I wouldn't describe them as sh properly sharp, um, but they are really decently pointy. So like that, they don't hurt. They're not like stabby, um, but they have a nice, fineness ratio isn't a term we use in knitting. Um, but like, so the point where the tapering starts is quite low down. So the knit pro, the, the zings, the point is quite sort of short. So the angle ends up being quite like shallow, I guess. Well, depending which way you look at it. Um, this, it, they have a much more gradual taper, which means you have much skinnier ends, which I really like. Um, so I very quickly just cast on, didn't want to talk about the needles without having tried them. Um, so I very quickly just done a teeny tiny bit of cabling, um, with my Mendip DK. So these are a four millimeter needle. Uh, so I'm really sorry. I'm not using us sizes because I don't know them. Um, I convert them for my patterns, but I, I just metric all the way. Um, you can't even see those cables. Um, but I gave them a go and I'm really pleased so far. Um, they, they are quite satisfying to use. Um, yeah, we'll see like if I do a bit of a big, bigger project, um, how I get along with them. But so far appearance is really good. So nice pointy interchangeable needles that fit with my existing set that mean I don't have to overhaul and buy a whole new needle set, which I definitely can't afford, or faff around with two different needle sets, which I, no. Um, so for the tiny sizes, I'm quite happy to stick with Chowgu because there's only a limited number of ones I need there. Um, these ones, so far, really pleased with. Um, they're just a solid piece of metal, so they're not gonna snap on me, uh, well, I'll be astounded if they did. Um, so yeah, bit of needle chat, which I haven't really done. Like I know a lot of people when talking about their projects will mention what needles they're using, what size, what material. I have mentioned before that sometimes I use a smaller needle in my left hand than on my right hand. Sometimes I'll have a metal one on the left hand and a wooden one on the right hand. Um, those are mostly just to aid with speed of knitting, but also knitting flat. Um, I, t I can, with certain yarns, tend to row out a bit, which is where your pearls are looser than your knit. So when you're knitting stockinette flat, you can end up with like little ridges. Um, so I will often use a smaller needle as my working needle when I'm purling. Um, to make my pearls a little bit tighter to balance out the fabric. It looks like it's a problem I am slowly addressing and getting rid of. Needle chat. Um, so yes, very pleased with those, pleased with my purchase. Whenever I break or lose any further Knit Pro needles, I will probably be replacing them with those, um, just because they, they seem quite nice to use and Obviously they're a bit more expensive than the Zings, but they're still much more affordable than the Chow Goos. So, yay. 
It's been quite a while since I've shared any non-knitting craft with you, um, mostly because I haven't really been doing any. Um, haven't had much time, super busy all the time. Um, but we on this house have quite an old-fashioned doorbell that we got. Um, it's in the shape of a duck, which I find quite amusing. Um, and when we got it, uh, it came with a fairly nasty bit of string as the bell pull. Um, and it was all, it was originally white and had been all stained and wasn't a very nice thing in the first place. Um, and so I made some cordage for it, um, just out of spider plant leaves. Um, I haven't been looking after my plants as well as I should, so have a lot of dead spider plant leaves. Um, they are not the strongest cordage materials in the world. Um, if you have been watching for a long time, you might have seen me make cordage before. Um, cordage is basically just like string or twine that you make out of plant fibres. Um, this one, I'm going to untwist it. It was originally quite a nice pale, um, sort of beigey colour, but has got blackened because it's been outside and this thing is super rusty. Um, so this was just a piece of cordage that I made. You can see it snaps really easily. Um, it was never intended to be a permanent one, but I just wanted one on there. Um, this is the little bit that goes on the end and then that hooks inside the bell. Uh, that is the bit that actually does the dinging. Um, I've taken it off so that it'll be easier for me to attach the cord. Um, there's a little eye at the bottom there, which I will thread it through. Um, and I thought it was about time I made some slightly better cord, uh, cordage. Uh, so I have... <laughs> this is going to be rustly, I am sorry, please forgive me. Um, basket of basket stuff. Um, this was an old picnic hamper, I think. Um, it's knackered. It used to have some kind of latch on it, which it doesn't anymore. Um, it's full of just materials that I have gathered from the floor at various points. We've got, that one's some clematis, various bits of hollyhock, um, lots of nasturtium, because nasturtiums grow rampantly when you let themselves seed, and it's amazing. Oh, look! I've got a little basket that's in progress that I had entirely forgotten about. Oh, and it's got a needle attached to it! I've been quite short of darning needles, and I keep wondering where they're going. It's probably on things like this. <laughs> um, and there's some braided nasturtium there that I made quite a while ago. I think with the intention of making a straw hat, that's just obviously never going to happen. Um, I should finish that, that's going to be quite nice. Uh, that's a little coiled basket. Um, I'll be doing some of that at some point. Cool! Yay! Um, so yes, box of basketry stuff, things I found on the floor. <laughs> this bag is no different. So we have um, some woodland near where we live. Um, it's very different to the copse where I used to go frequently near our old house, which was mostly ash and some hazel, um, little bits of holly and a few beech trees. Mostly ash though, which we'll see how that looks in a few years time. Um, here we have the nearest woods are mostly evergreens. There are lots of larches there. So I suspect this might be larch bark, but I'm not sure. Um, so this is just a load of inner bark. So the outer bark is really tough and textured, as you see, like on the outside of trees. Um, but the inner bark is often, you can strip it off and it's quite flexible and strong. Uh, and I just happened to pick up a big piece of bark as we were out on a walk uh, and started splitting it down as we walked, as you do. Um, but yeah, so this stuff is really nice and strong. And so I was hoping to get some of the finer bits because I'm going to be twisting this 
as like a two ply but then once I thread it through the eye on the bell ringer um, I'll be twisting it back on itself so it'll end up being like a four ply um, and so I want some finer bits so that it won't end up being too unwieldy and chunky but at the same time I want it to be really nice and strong um, and I will soak these up and I'll just share a little bit of how I'm going to twist them up. We'll see if I manage to get it finished. Because um, some bits are quite sort of, some bits are fairly kind of hairy looking and have split out quite nicely, but some bits are still just quite stuck together. Um, and you can separate them out, but probably better when they're a bit wet. Um, and so you soak them so that they get nice and flexible. Um, and that means they won't break or snap while you're working with them. I mean, that should be ample because I need a piece of cordage that's like this long. Um, so I shall go and put those on to soak in just some like warm water. I'll put them in the sink um, because yeah um there's another sink in the room right next to it so i don't feel too bad about taking up the sink for a little while i'll soak them for probably about half an hour and then we'll try twisting them up a bit and we'll see how it goes so i've been soaking my little bits of bark i'm gonna keep them in this plastic bag hideous as it is um because it will mean that they don't dry out too quickly. And I'm just quickly going to show you how I begin making the cordage. Just want to pick a nice bit to start with. Decent long bit. Let's just go for that big bit. Um, so some bits, well pretty much all of them, I think will need a little bit more stripping down. I want to break up any like really big thick bits like that. See that's got some of the outer bark still attached to it. So that needs to come off. Mm, this bit might not want to go. Sometimes you can get it by sort of twisting a little bit. There we go. You see how that's just separating out nicely there. Now I'll just see. That's going to be a bit too fine on its own. So I will hold a couple of strands together I think like that should be good. So to start off, it's really easy because you don't need any tools um, and you know, you can do it when you're just out and about. So you want to find the middle bit and I usually do it so that with my left hand, I'll hold it still. With my right hand, I twist away from me and it's a really little movement. And then that creates twist. So it's the same, sort of the same end result as making yarn, but you get there in a different way because you are both twisting and plying at the same time. Whereas with a yarn, usually you will twist a single and then ply the yarns together. So we've got twist in there. Now you will know from when you've twisted anything like that, it wants to bounce back on itself. So I'm gonna fold it like that and then that creates a nice little twist and so then I keep the section closest to me just held just with my fingers there and then again with my right hand I'll take the section furthest away from me 
and twist it away from me. When I've got a good bit of twist there where it's going to, I can't really twist it more without it being uncomfortable, I pass it over the top towards me, I'll grab it with those fingers, and then do the same with the other piece that's now further away. Twist the furthest away piece away from me. And then I've got a little bit of twist over that centimetre or so, and so those bits just want to twist together. Now I'm sort of getting to the end of some bits here, so I will just grab... Just split that off so it's not going to get too fat there. Can I just literally lay that on top. Sometimes I'll overlap it over the bit that I've already done and then I just chop those extra ends off when I'm finished. You can leave them on, it just gives you a really hairy looking piece of cordage. And then again, we need a bit more material in here. So I'll add some more. That's probably fine for now. And you just keep twisting away and adding in new bits as you need them. Now, I'm not the neatest at making cordage. Um, I tend to do it sort of fairly functionally. But it is something that I find very soothing because, as I say, you don't need tools. Um, you just need your hands and a bit of material. And it's something that when you're out and about, you can find materials. It's You don't even need to live somewhere re really rural. Like, yes, I got these pieces from my local woods, but I've also made cordage from, you know, prunings of people's plants that have fallen onto the pavement. Um, like, you, you, can, you can find materials all over the place. It doesn't have to be plant material even. You could do this with cut up strips of plastic bag and that would make a really, really, really strong piece of cordage might not necessarily be the prettiest, but it would be functional. Um, and you know, it's a great skill for if you're, um, for example, out in the garden and need a little bit of string. This is if you do have a garden. Um, if you need a bit of twine or something to tie something, you can just make some, which, I just find is a really nice skill um, and it's very relaxing. Now I'm going to have to get more bits out of my bag because these bits are all a little bit short or too skinny. you begin to pick up like you get a bit of an eye for what you're looking for in terms of materials and it's really fun to experiment with them um, so yeah I'll keep going with this a little bit and we'll see how I go now I've got a slightly scraggy looking little bit of cordage uh, it's not completely even in terms of thickness, but it's fine. I'm just going to trim off some of the more egregiously hairy bits. Just to neaten things up a little bit. It's possible to do this much more neatly. Um, a lot of the time the material you use, but also your technique will affect how neat it looks. Um, it's quite a rustic bell pull, so I'm quite fine with it looking a bit hairy. At the end here, I've just uh, tied a little knot. I'm just going to trim those ends off there 
and that will eventually be hidden inside there. So now let me remember how we go. Yeah, so this end, so you end up with one end that's twisted back on itself like that, and then one end that's finished off however you choose to. I do a knot um, and then often neaten up later. So that just feeds nicely through there. Um, okay. Just having a think. Oh, I think I do it this way. So I go through to the halfway point. So this is where it'll be dangling down from. And now where previously I twisted away from myself, I'm going to twist towards myself. And so that is twisting it in the direction it's already been twisted, which makes it really over twisted. And then those two pieces of cordage want to twist together. So if this were a yarn, this will be a cable ply. I have to remember that I'm going in the opposite direction now, so rather than twisting away from myself and then crossing over away from my, uh, crossing away towards myself, twist towards myself and cross away from myself. And it just kind of, once you've got that twist in there, it just wants to twist in on itself um, to create a nice balanced piece of cordage. Um, and now, I remember having trouble with this bit last time. So what I think I'm going to do is find... Mm, what am I going to find? I'm going to chop off the knot because I'm not so worried about that. Hmm. Can I pass them both through there? Oh, I'm going to be able to do it. Great. This fibre is slightly stiffer than the snake plant I used, which when I tried to poke it through would just sort of bend on itself. Um, but this is stiff enough that I've been able to just pass it straight through, which is really handy. And then on the bottom, I'm going to separate out my two little bits there. And just get a bit more twist in there. And then this time I want a little knot that's just going to be slightly neater. Just doing a little reef knot. I want it to be quite nice and compact. And that will stop the end from coming off. And just grab those tiny little stubby ends with my nails and have a tug. And there we go. Just going to neaten off that little end bit. This bit will be underneath, so you won't really see it, but it's just so there aren't any sticky outy bits. And there we go. Now that, you can just trim off a bit more. Now that's ready to be hung back on the bell and you know it's not going to last forever because it's made of plants um, but it was a nice little project and if I need to replace it in I don't know a year's time I'm fine with that it cost almost nothing well it cost literally nothing in materials um, and a little bit of my time um, yeah you can find lots of nice little projects just 
for things like that and I think it's nice to have things that are just have had some time go into them. I might actually wax that. I'm going to put a little bit of wax on it before I put it outside which will protect it a little bit from the weather. And yeah. So there we are, a satisfying quick little project. Um, I hope you'll give Cordage a go if you've not tried it before. Uh, it's just something nice to do with your hands. Um, so before I go, I want to mention events because I've got quite a few things lined up now and it's been a long time since I have showed up professionally at any um, shows or anything. So Unravel, which is the 20, I think it's the 24th, 25th and 26th uh, of this month, February 2023, for in case you're watching way in the future. Sorry about that. Um, on the Saturday the 25th, I will be attending and at 2 p.m. I will be on the Garthenor stand and I will be doing a designer meet and greet. So if you're planning on going to Unravel, come by and say hello. I will have the designs with me that I have designed using Garth Hennel's yarn. Um, we'll be just chatting about some of my designs and we can help you pick colours and things if you want to make any of them. Um, I really, really enjoy their yarn and have used it a few times. And so it'll be really nice to catch people there. Uh, the next thing I will be doing is FiberQuest, which is the weekend of, I think it's the 18th and 19th of March. Uh, I will be exhibiting there. That is on Fernhill Farm, which is where the wool for my Mendip yarn comes from. So it is on the Mendip Hills. Um, and it's a fairly new um, sort of fibre-based show that combines with Fernhill's spring sheep shearing um, and I attended as a visitor last year with a very little baby attached to me <laughs> um, and this year I'm going to have my own stand and it's going to be really nice. So that's in Somerset if anyone wants to come along to that. Then I will be at Wonderwool in April and then uh, again I will have a stand at Wonderwool. Uh, it's a lovely show that I've been to quite a few times and have ended there before. Um, I really enjoy it. It's always nice to go to Wales. Uh, and then John Arben have just announced their uh, the schedule of events for their Mill Open weekend in June. Um, I'm going to be on a panel discussion with Garth Ennor again. Um, uh, River Knits, Daughter of a Shepherd, and I hope I haven't forgotten someone. I will put links to all of these things uh, in the description box below. Um, and it'll be really, really nice to have a chat with you, meet you if you're going to be showing up to them. Because um, I, I miss seeing people, I really do. I visited Unravel long, uh, in the autumn just as a visitor. Um, and it was really nice to bump into people occasionally, some people who'd seen the podcast. Um, if you do ever see me at a yarn show and you recognise me or anything, please come and say hello. I really, really like seeing people, chatting with people. I literally get, uh, when I go to yarn shows, when I'm visiting uh, or when I'm vending, I'm not really there to buy yarn because I have a fair bit of yarn um, that I'm working through uh, and I have my own yarn. Um, I'm mostly there to meet people and chat and if you want to just say hello, please don't be shy. Um, I, I'm generally friendly <laughs> um, and I really, really like to say hello to people who have either seen the podcast or knitted any of my designs or used my yarn. If you have those things with you, I love to see them. It literally makes my day, week, month. Um, it's what it's all about. So on that, yeah, come see me in person. Um, if you want to chat regularly with me, not in person, um, there is my Patreon group uh, on Patreon where we have a Discord group and uh, regular Zoom calls and it's super nice. 
and I'm going to leave it at that and I'll catch you next time and thank you very much for joining me. Bye bye!